It's how was, yeah, what's interesting? For me, because when I married the first time, I got married in the Great Synagogue in Cape Town, and the whole of South Africa, the Great Synagogue was beautiful to me. And uh, when we went to see the rabbi, he wanted to know what our wedding ring would be. And I said, well, it was a, a ring that had diamonds in it, but it was from white gold. And he said, oh, no, you can't do that at all. So he said, you have to find a ring and bring it to me, and I'll marry you with the, a plain gold back. So I went to my grandmother. And I said to her, can I have your ring? So I'll, you know, come with me to the rabbi and I'll take the ring and we'll do it. And the rabbi and my grandmother said, no, you can't get married with my ring. Because it's mine. I said, but I'll pay you for it for the day. <laughs> no, she said, it won't work. So my mother had her mother's ring that she never wore. So I took my mother with the ring to the rabbi. And I bought it from her in front of her for $10. Why do you have to buy it? Because it has, it has to be yours. yours. But it has but to be. It should not be yours. Right. It should be your husband. That's right. He owes him ten dollars. <laughs> oh. But if you're not Avril, she owns her husband. So essentially, <laughs> the ring is owned by him. No, so. <laughs> so I took. We all went to the rabbi, and we bought the ring, and I told him he should keep it. So he kept the ring and he married us <laughs> and it was the chief rabbi Abraham who was kept on the really? time. Oh, yes. Amazing man. So a ring. Rings are important things rings in today's really wedding important. ceremony. So he ma- and then of course the next Imagine day. if he would have given you a quarter under the chuppah. How would it make you feel? I oh, really had the diamond ring. <laughs> so you didn't, you didn't care. <laughs> But before we, we get into this article, I wanted, yesterday my wife told me something that she was speaking with a Rebbitzin somewhere, who was talking to her about the significance of eating certain foods on Shabbat. The significance of potato kugel, the significance of cholent, the significance of fish, specifically gefilte fish. And it was like a whole long discussion, and my wife was stopping herself from laughing. And... She hung up the phone, and I said, I'm very, very... It bothers me to my, the core of my being. I said, what bothers you from the core of your being? I said, it bothers me that this religion that we're teaching is so silly. It bothers me. And I just, I'm ranting, and I have to tell you. I've spent my... Not a long life, but my whole life studying Jewish texts. From the Chumash, the Tanakh, to the Gemara, Mishnah, Halakha, Kabbalah, Hashkafa, all kinds of books. And we're talking about a religion that defeated Aristotle and Socrates and Plato. We're talking about a religion that put the philosophers of every other religion to shame. We're talking about a religion that the Ramban threw at James of Aragon and disproved Christianity. We're talking about something that the whole world is based on. And all I can talk about in 2015 is the significance of potato kugel <laughs> on a Friday night dinner. I, I, something here is, is blowing my mind, I'll tell you. I have to be down the gavs I'm going to judge favorably. There are certain people that it's important to give meaning to everything in their life. So instead of just having a Shabbat dinner just because, they want that everything we eat at the Shabbat dinner should have some kind of significance. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with giving significance to things that have no significance. Half of what we're reading about the wedding ceremony, why, why does it have to be that important? Why does this detail have to mean so much? But it's okay. It's okay if when someone does something, they want everything to have meaning. I give it to you. But to make that the center of our Judaism, to make that, that's what I'm hearing everywhere on the streets when people are talking about, that's what Dvar Torahs and Shabbat are about, that's what people are writing books about. It's an absurd thing. We have the most intelligent religion on the planet. We have the only philosophy in the world that can outdo every other philosophy. We have the only Torah that was written by the one who created the universe. I have to stop talking about potato kugel. I, I just, I, something in me is, is I don't know how else to say it. <laughs> Not, it, it it's it's irrelevant. insignificant and, and childish. Maybe it's relevant to somebody, but it's childish. Yeah. And what it, makes, what it makes the next generation feel is as follows. Oh, there's nothing intelligent about my parents' religion. It's just 
potato kugel. It's just culture. It's just a nice story that happened. There was a flood, and there was an ark, and there were animals that were there. That's all we can tell people. That's all we can talk about. And of course, somebody who was going to a, an Ivy League school, or, or his parents paid for them for a very good education, and they wake up and they say, what I'm studying at university, what I'm studying in high school, what I'm, what I'm exploring in my life is a highly experiential, intelligent approach to the world. And, and what I've been hearing at synagogue from the rabbi who's, who, I don't know who's older, him or, or Jewish tradition, and he's sharing this, these stories and this belief, and the, it sounds so childish to him. And when he has to make a choice between Torah, between Hashem, or between what he's experiencing in the world, what choice would you make? What choice would any thinking person make? And it's, it's, it's incredible to me that we blame assimilation and intermarriage as the destruction of the Jewish people when I believe that we've been destroying the Jewish people from the inside for so long. We have not been giving Jews Judaism. Now, Judaism, I don't mean... Uh, say someone said, I'm Jewish. I'm Jewish. You know, I'm not really Jewish. I, we give them like a culture, like a feeling. Purim is all about... It's a Jewish Halloween. That's what Purim is. When do we really get into the nitty-gritty details of Purim being a fundamental Jewish holiday? It's basically. It could be. I am definitely were in America, and the Judaism that I'm speaking about is mostly in American Judaism. I have my other problems with the, with an Israeli Judaism, perhaps being a little too rigid and strict, but definitely um, childish it's not. Uh, maybe it's too serious, but childish it's not. But I am talking about a Western Jewish uh, uh, feeling, and it's not surprising to me that people are running away from it, that people are... are f it's like a fire. I'm running away from fire. I don't want to get burned. I don't want to be part of this. I don't want to be part of the silly old people that come to synagogue. I don't want to. It's interesting you should say that. Because on Saturday I was at a mitzvah with a child who's talking about his passion from Noah and how when he was reading it he learned all about <coughs> pi. And everybody <coughs> said that pi, 3.145, and it's actually in the Torah. And that's where he, he couldn't believe that he always thought it belonged to Aristotle or Socrates or this, this one got it from here, and it's actually... Um, it's mentioned in the Talmud, in Trapte yes, Sukkah. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And it's, it was, for me, <coughs> for me, it was, I was, that of mind, I didn't know. I really didn't know. And so it, it made me realize that there's far more to it than what meets the eye. So it's funny we should say that, because we discussed this over the weekend. This is, this is the, fun, thank you for sharing, this is, it's, a, it's a fundamental issue, and I don't know why no one's talking about it. I, I would run away also if that's what I was being taught, if that's what I was being exposed to. And, ironically, the, the, those who give meaning to everything in Judaism, and significance to everything in Judaism, they they could actually be doing a much better job because if everything had meaning and if everything had significance, and everything, you would feel that you're part of some highly sophisticated group of people. But when that becomes the only thing you could talk about, what it recently said, we just brought up uh, a mitzvah to me. I'll tell you what I was thinking about. Why do we have a mezuzah on our door? <laughs> See, but most people tell you to protect your home. Well, that's a highly non-Jewish idea. Maimonides says, how could you say such a thing? What in Mizuzah is like, a, it's a, as an amulet, it's, a, it's a, some kind of kamiya. We don't, we don't believe that Mizuzah today, oh, what about us, their famous story about Onkelos and, 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 and the soldiers that came to get him, and he says, Hashem stands outside of our house, and we stand on the inside. There's a famous story like that. Hey, listen, when I had to explain to Roman soldiers to save my life, I would also make up stories. But... A mezuzah has, if you would delve into the secrets of a mezuzah, the idea behind a mezuzah, that there's a mezuzah on your door, it tells your children about a kadosh b'chu, but even on our, everything in our life has, has a kadosh b'chu, shmai inside of it. It became an M, so now they sell car mezuzahs, people sell necklace mezuzahs, all kinds of crazy things. Why? Because we've made Judaism into some fiddler on the roof religion. To the point where, as a rabbi today, if I'll mention a, a halakha to somebody and say, did you know that the Mishnah, the Talmud, the Rambam, Shulchan Aruch, they all say X. But Fiddler on the Roof says Y. <laughs> all the Jews in the world will follow the Fiddler on the Roof. They won't follow the Rambam or the Shulchan Aruch or the Mishnah or the Talmud. And that, that is such a sad thing. Because this will be the end of our religion. This will ruin it. 
Nothing else. Not the, um, not the, the culture on the street and not the Arabs in Israel. Not, nobody's going to end our religion except for ourselves. That being said, um, last week I got mixed feedback on this article and I need you to be honest with you. So don't, please don't make it. I, don't, I didn't write this article so I don't feel bad about whoever wrote the article. I just printed it from the computer. Some people found this article very, very interesting. Marriage, weddings, the halachot behind it. Some found it not something I'd like to spend the rest of the month on. Um, it's okay either way. I'm just going to choose whether we pick one or two topics out of this article and then go forward. Or if we take the article head on. Um, I'm, I'm not against either way. I just want to know what you think. I don't have a vote, a discussion. Yeah, I'd, like, <laughs> I'd like to continue with it because I find yeah, it interesting. I find it, I find it interesting. fascinating. And I think that everybody should be open-minded to be able to accept everything and learn everything. Afro, now what happens if someone disagrees with you at this table? Uh, I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> everyone can agree. Yeah, yeah, I don't care. Okay. I But maybe... <laughs> I think you can, can compromise like middle... I think I, I can learn I, 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 I enjoy learning about different things because I was yeah. growing up in a very different country. My mother was an atheist. And we didn't practice religion at all. And we got together to Passover. It was sort of sitting at the table. And everybody say grace. You say grace and you eat. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, grace, that's an so old Jewish thing. Yeah. Yeah. We had matzah. And I had the matzah. I hit the matzah and I found it. And everybody said, mazel tov. And uh, that, was, uh, that was how I grew up. So coming into a, a class like this is very refreshing because I'm learning a lot. Not only about how I grew up, but about how other people grew up. So this is very interesting to me. Thank you. And anyone have a different feeling? I have. Yes. Feeling. Declare one more. Um, I felt last week as if we were talking about culture. And not, you know, the inner mute the uh, inner uh, religion uh, it was less spiritual more technical yeah. okay I, I, I agree Why? with you I, I felt that way too I felt that way too I, it interests me though to see like you know because yeah, I, the culture I was like I, I, I was under the impression of it was outside it has to be outside <laughs> you know because yes. that's what I learned and that's and then I found out, well, it's not necessarily and Let me tell you a story, by the way. What is the reason why it is? So it was interesting, but I also, I mean, if we would only do this, I would say, I don't know how long I'm going to come to this class, but to do just for a little while to look at different customs and how they, they got there, so that, yeah. that's okay with I, I find it interesting because, again, it's a different religion. It's a... It's, What's it's, a different it's, religion? It's, no, sorry. <laughs> different <laughs> traditions, different traditions. I was saying different, same religion, different traditions. You know, there's that Mish- Gemara says, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you, you said a prophecy thinking, and you don't know what you're saying. I, I was saying, I was saying different, I was thinking I'm different kidding, tradition and I said religion. So different traditions, it's not, it's not about the, it's, it's about how the tra- traditions Oops. may be connected to the actual religion. But I think it's uh, it's always interesting to know about how different people do certain things. The thing is that, that, that what Rabbi Yogi, I think, trying to do is to show how much custom there are into the religion. So I think if yeah. you take that from this angle, that angle. And, uh, and show how much of it is cultural thing versus halakha, yeah. I, think, I, I don't think we should skip the like the parts okay. where where he talks like the, you know like seeing each other. Yeah. But I think we. I don't, I don't I, think we should I think skip. It's all of it, but I think so why don't we do something that's like, like a compromise in the middle? Well, there there's a reason. Some some points on this article really hit me. I want to know what's cultural and what's, what's, yeah. what's yeah. Like, right. I'm not interested in the cultural thing. You know. uh, right. Yeah. See, that's the. the part, but he, 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 comes, <laughs> but he comes from the place where he wants to show you that it's yeah. so let me well, let's try something today and that is there are, there are definitely points in here last week what I did was went like every footnote went to every detail we don't have to we don't have to there are main points in this article that I think should be highlighted and we can do both we can give both and we could definitely focus on the non-technical parts of this to show that it's really at the crux of how you understand our religion 
both of these traditions stem from holy places, but they both are tackling Judaism from a very, very different perspective. And when we're focusing on the Judaism of the future, we have to say, well, which one would I, which one would I try to adapt or adapt from or take from? Which attitude is going to be the most relevant? Um, Let's try something. I want to read something with you. Hi. And then we'll I, discuss if you actually are familiar. Yeah. Something. When, last week when you mentioned about the ring being squared and round, my, actually my, my sister, her husband is supporting. I don't know, Shami or Hanabi, because sure. they're different. In, but her wedding ring is actually on the outside. It's like a square. And then obviously it's, it's, it's round inside. Mine is too. That's an old Sephardic custom that nobody does today. I don't know if he made it because of custom or because of design. Or because of design. It's a square ring, and if I know carry gold, then the thing is I can't wear it here. Why? Because the gold from South Africa and the gold from here is totally different. The gold here is impure. So when I wore the ring through, because it's soft, uh, and I took it to a jeweler, they cannot and they cannot repair it. I had to send it back to South Africa to be repaired. I can only wear it on certain days. But yes, it is square and it is circular. That, so, nice. so let's look. Can I say twice. something also? Yes, please. I'm, you can say 20 things also. <laughs> um, since I came to, to orthodoxy much late, I mean in my mid-20s, so I learned it one way, right? So um, and just kind of absorbed it one way. And I realize that you get very attached like, you know, when this thing about, you get very attached to customs. Sure. Yeah. Because they, it's like what your mother always fed you. You love that food. It's a, it's a sentimental that, value. You know, it has, it, you become very attached to it. And it's really, unco- like, I really, and it's very uncomfortable to, I, I felt it very much when you need, my daughter got married. Because a lot of things at the wedding were, were not. Different than the way you different. would. And there was a certain sense of discomfort about it. It wasn't like, ah, oh, I'm swimming in my own bath water. It's like, whoa. <laughs> it, There's another so, tide coming in. It, yeah. And it, it was very yes. interesting to notice that. I mean, the, you imagine I knew what there was nothing my in-laws, Can you imagine what my in-laws felt like at our wedding? <laughs> <laughs> you know, can you imagine? It's, it's a... I don't think, you, like, Tamar at least could say she has the luxury of having been at different kinds of weddings in her life. Could I say such a thing? Um, yes, but not very much. Really? Not very much, really? because what, who, who is my circle? Where am I invited to weddings? They were mainly Chabad weddings. Really? Okay. Well, so Shuba weddings may be as opposed to... Um, like Crown Heights weddings? Crown Heights okay. Crown Heights weddings, but... You can imagine my in-laws don't have one Sephardic person in their extended family. And I'm talking about every family has like 13 kids. So 10 kids, 12 kids, the average is like 11, okay? So for them seeing such a, a wedding, I have to tell my, my father-in-law was incredibly... was not... So was more like what they're used to it. No, not at all. My wedding was very interesting. And you see the communities, you have this problem a lot. What happens when a Vizhnitzer marries a Babavar? Who, what do you do the wedding like? Like the Vizhnitzers do it? Or like the, the Baba verse do it? Uh, so, so by the chuppah, the chuppah always goes according to the groom. And the rest of the wedding, the bride's family kind of takes over. So until the chuppah and after the chuppah is the bride's family, but the chuppah itself is the groom's family. So in my wife's family's um, DNA is built in, built in that whichever person they marry is going to do the chuppah probably could be a motivator to not have you marry out because you would want the chuppah, which is the highlight of the wedding, to be the way you're doing it. But I'm going to be very honest with you. My father-in-law, and at that point we weren't as close as we are today. Today, Bokh we're very close with each other, contrary to everything you hear in these classes. <laughs> yeah, today, we're, oh, I just spoke to him on the phone. We're, we're Bokh Hashem. Then, I didn't know the man. I, I, just, I knew that he, he barely want wanted to be there, right? He didn't want to know me either. And he came to me before the wedding, and he said, listen, this is your chuppah. You're getting married once. Every person under the chuppah, you're going to choose. Every custom under the chuppah, you're going to choose. The rabbi under the chuppah, you're choosing. I am not getting involved. And what I did was I told him, listen, I will take you up on this offer. 
Every custom under the chuba will be mine. Every halacha under the chuba will be mine. Every person under the chuba, my wife's getting married also. And I think we should split it half and half. There's two witnesses, so one witness should be from my side, one from your side. There's seven brachot, uh, three and four, whatever. We'll split, uh, and so on and so forth. And we, we came to a nice, a nice um, compromise. But at the end, there was a purely Sephardic chuba. There was nothing at all, aside from maybe some of the rabbis, Rosh Ashkenazi, read blessings. But all the customs, and it was very hard for them, very difficult. I, I absolutely get what you're saying. But perhaps, perhaps as we're going into this world where, if you look around the table, we all come from very different backgrounds. Even, even those of us around the table who are Sephardic come from very different Sephardic backgrounds. Or those who are Ashkenazi come from very... You, for example, you come from a Chabad background. I'm sure there are people here who Chabad is a completely different tradition than the Ashkenazi tradition they grew up with. And what I feel is maybe a formula for the future is feeling very comfortable with all of them. Mm-hmm. But by knowing that... Because you, you, of course you say, like, I believe those Jews are right. I just I don't understand what they're doing. But if I really understood what they were doing, I wouldn't even be bothered by it. Um, or I would be bothered by it if I, if I knew what they were doing. <laughs> right? depends, depends on what it is that they're doing, of course. Okay, I'm. I think it also is different if it's just a matter of like food, like if you talk culture, about the fish, mm-hmm. or, or cocoa. That that really is not so important. But a chupa is already like a, a different situation. So let's look at one halacha because you just brought up. This is a halacha that seems to be a custom, but it's not. And I, I want to. It's exactly the part where we're up to, which is the second page. What's that? Nisuin, you see Nisuin? Yes, the second part of the wedding ceremony. Okay. So we have the first part, uh, which is the the Erusin, right? That's the, and then the Nisuin. So Nisuin is where we're up to. Let's read it because this is actually the point that I wanted to talk about today, regardless of where we were. I didn't know where we were in the article. Actually, we did. I think we did. No, we, the didn't. Fir- no, we huh? didn't. We, we got didn't just, really we go just stopped the bottom of the first page. Yeah. Yes. The second part of the no, wedding ceremony involved the recitation of seven okay. blessings in the presence of a minion. The seven blessings, or the Sheva Brachot. You see the KH? Yeah. Yes, I could. It throws us off, right? Are you kidding? I've never seen it. Actually, this is the one. You see it on maps of of Israel where the other people have a decision about how to... Well, KH is the legal American way to transliterate. Whereas Tamar pointed out last week that in German, right? CH is... So it could be that's where the Jews picked it up. But KH, like when they write um, right. a, a lot of words, KH is a ch sound. Yeah, and, and Kiryat is a K instead a Q. of a Q. Other way around, it's a Q instead a of a Q. K. in Israel, but a K, yeah. Right, right. It's it like Tamshad, uh, mm-hmm. right, your son's name with a KH. With a KH, sure. Right. That's the, right. Or like in Spanish, you would probably use a J, right? That would be a ch sound? Yeah. Right, so. But I. I mean, because you have to remember that in, in Hebrew, proper Hebrew, is a sound, not a like we say it. So, well, yeah, in, in Spanish, the the, the het, yeah. sorry, the J, the J, and the K, well, the K, but there's also cha. Oh, yeah, then there's a CH. Right. Yeah. But, but the sound, the sound is chill. <laughs> Can we pass them over this direction? <laughs> <laughs> I, I made it up. Hello. Tell me it doesn't match, right? <laughs> His dad rest in one eye. You're lucky you came with clothes. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. Okay. Sheva Brachot, I recited over a cup of wine. Well, yes. Ashkenazi, uh-huh. use a second sorry. cup of wine, whereas Sephardi, we fill the first. The European tradition has nothing to do with Wait, the let's pause there. So this is a simple thing. Ashkenazim use one cup of wine for both ceremonies, while Sephardim use two cups of wine. Uh, other way, Ashkenazim use two cups of wine. Actually, most weddings that I officiate, I use two cups of wine. Um, for a very simple reason that some people don't appreciate drinking out of a glass of wine that someone else drank from. And so, because people are picky, so I just have, sometimes I even use four glasses of wine, depending on, I'll ask them, like, the, does the bride mind drinking from the groom's cup? Sometimes it really bothers her. Or, does the, does the, uh, the rabbi drinking from the glass? Everyone has their own thing, but basic halakha. Sephardic tradition has one cup they use for the first part of the ceremony, and then it's refilled. 
And the Ashkenazim have two cups, one for the first part of the ceremony, one for the second part of the ceremony. Okay, the European tradition... Was, the European tradition has nothing to do with the halakhic stricture of yayin pagum. Do you know what yayin pagum means? Is it... Spoiled wine. Yeah. Um, at the bottom of page 11, the footnotes that you're looking at, there's a halakha that says that if you drink from a glass of wine, for example, let's say you're about to make kiddush, but you wanted to like sip from it first, you can't make kiddush on that wine because it's not considered proper to reuse wine uh, for kiddush. Okay. Um, the way to fix that is just to refill the cup with a little bit more wine that has not been uh, sipped from, and then it's now considered uh, non-pagum again. Yes. Okay. Which is easily rectified by adding non-pagum wine into the cup. Rather, it may have to do with preserving an element of the original custom of Yerush and Nisuin being two distinct rituals performed months apart. By using a second cup of wine, the officiating rabbi distinguishes one ceremony from the other. Okay, so tradition. This is a big part here. Tradition. Remember that the engagement, the, not really engagement, the Erosi in the first part of the marriage was done months, even a year before the wedding. And then the actual wedding happened a year later, or six months later, or five months, or whatever it was they did it. Uh, my grandfather in Yemen, the same thing happens. And he got engaged, but then he had to go work to buy his bride. They signed up to work for maybe a year and a half. He went to work and make enough money to put a dowry and to, to get his cousin. So he knew for that year and a half that he was engaged. And what did engaged mean then? If they were to separate, they would actually have to get divorced. Yes. Because there was a halachic ceremony that was begun, and there are two parts. One in the first part, and one many months later. And so he's saying it could be that Ashkenazim kept the two cups to show that there are two different ceremonies that traditionally were done very far apart, and today we do them in the same breath uh, under the chuppah. Yeah, mine but, was months apart. Oh, I had yeah. that knowing. I, I don't remember what... But at your Tanayim, they didn't do the Erosim. Although some Ashkenazi rabbis they, don't like that they did Tanayim by your engagement either, because that makes you bound to each other. We have... My grandfather, you know, he read it. And it was like a ketubah almost. Yeah, it was like a ketubah. My, in the Hasidic circles, they still do this. In Ashkenazi circles, I believe, very, they don't, the Litvish people, they don't do this anymore. Okay. And because it's a dangerous thing. What happens if after that you would have decided, hey, I'm done? Well, that's what my grandfather told me. This is, you can, you can break a marriage easier than you can break at knowing. Right, because you get, you get into a very complicated gray area of are you married or not, and so what is the protocol of getting out of this yes. con- arrangement. Okay. But there's a more interesting reason, and this is the reason I wanted to dwell on today, and I'm sorry if it offends anybody, but it's important to speak about because it's a Jewish issue that needs to be spoken about. And we'll do it here. The more interesting reason, somebody... The more interesting reason given is found in classic work on marriage originating in Ashkenaz called Shulhan Ha'ezah. There is, there the author Rabbi Yitzhak Tzvi Leibovit, Central European War One, argues that the reason two cups are necessary has to do with the possibility that the bride or groom are Shabbos desecrators. And once they drink from the glass of wine, the wine is disqualified and cannot be blessed again. Pause before you throw rocks. Just pause. Okay? I want you to read the next paragraph, and then I'm going to explain everything you just read. Don't throw rocks yet. Each of the explanations for two cups of wine under the chuppah is independently fascinating. The first suggests a lingering commitment to the way ceremonies were observed in the past and doing whatever possible to preserve even commemorations of the past behaviors. Rabbinic authorities in Ashkenaz infuse tradition with religion significance. And even if the custom is irrelevant today, the way it was done in the past remains sacred. Let's pause you there. Does that... Have you heard that before? That that's the way we've done it and we don't change it even though things have changed. This is a very old Ashkenazi tradition that is brought to the table, which is that customs are important, traditions are important. Even if they're no longer relevant, we still hold on to them. The second reason? Is that not so in, in Sephardic circles? Not, not at all in Sephardic circles. 
actually to hold on to a tradition that is irrelevant um, would be shown as a sign of, of ignorance. Of I don't, I'm still doing something even though it's not relevant. Um, I can't say for all smart. I'll tell you, I sent this article to my one of my friends, students, Levi Morrow, in Jerusalem, and he wrote back a very interesting critique. He said he agrees with this article, but you have to be honest that if you were to step out of traditional Sephardic circles and into more modern Kabbalistic Sephardic circles, such as the Ben Ishchai or the Kaf Chaim, you might find them to be more similar to the Ashkenazi tradition of holding on to things that are no longer relevant. I mean, you do have a camp within mm-hmm. Sephardic Jewry that well, is that's very the similar. The premise is that it's still relevant regardless of the times. That's the point. Why and is it still relevant? Because it has not a rational reason behind it, but a Kabbalistic mm-hmm. reason. Very good. That's so that's where you go into this realm of Sephardic Kabbalists, which. See, I made Tamar smile. <laughs> Sephardic. <laughs> Sephardic Kabbalists always existed, it's never taken away. But Sephardic Kabbalists mixing their Kabbalah into the way Jewish law functions is a very recent development. Not older than 100 years old, 120 years old. And so, yes, it's true. What I told you is right in traditional Sephardic circles, but in Kabbalistic Sephardic circles, they would be like what you're saying. All right? The second reason? The second reason introduces an inescapable element that involves the larger community. Clergy serve the public, and the community is a piece of people who observe the law at varying degrees. The Ashkenazi rabbinic authorities protect the clergy from the pitfalls of such contact by introducing scriptures that halakhically have little to do with the ceremony at hand. All right. So you're saying is the second reason is using two cups has nothing to do with the wedding ceremony and everything to do with protecting the rabbi who's officiating the ceremony from compromising on matters of halakha that are important to him. Because he's officiating in the ceremony where people are uh, different levels of observance. The bride and groom could be... Maybe the bride and the chubad not even dressed. You don't, you don't know what it would be that would... But the rabbi has to deal with everybody. He's the rabbi of the community. And so the into the system of Ashkenazi halakha they were protecting the rabbi from the danger or the pitfall of drinking wine that was touched by someone who does not observe Shabbat. And this is where we're going to open up a nice can of worms that has many, many worms inside. And, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> lots of worms. And I, but I think, I think it's a fair discussion. And it's fair to know there are two sides to the story. Um, and it's also fair to know that one who does hold up one side of this opinion, of this argument, it's a, is allowed to but should be very open and honest and deal with the consequences of such a belief. Meaning, meaning, if one is to believe that wine that is touched by non-Shabbat observers invalidates the wine, which I don't believe, but which someone would believe, is very, very important that they are willing to deal with the consequences of what having such a belief will have on the greater Jewish community. Such as some people who might be sitting around the table and feeling slightly offended. So let's look into this and, and see where does this come from. Yeah, two paragraphs, three, two and a half. It's like mm. the pilpul, like that's what I think. Like, how did he reach here? How did he get um, here? Like, right? Meaning, you have two cups by the wedding. Like, like all kinds of reasons, lumps, you know. Come yeah. together, they have nothing to do with each other. Right. Yeah, this, like, is, uh, this is. This is. <laughs> right? This is a classic, though. It's because, see what she's doing with her thumb? Mm-hmm. It's exactly what happens when you... The pinfall of the Talmud. Right. They, it's they it's a certain... Just for the pinfall. And so when you study <coughs> that certain style of Jewish learning, it affects everything that you study as well. You can see a simple halakha suddenly became three different reasons that have nothing to do with each other, but are all attached to a certain halakha. I want to read to you a ruling from the Shulchan And in this ruling, you might start to begin where the problem starts. There's a law called Yain Nesach. Thank you. You're welcome. I have three cups. It's three cups, just in case you don't drink from them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like it. Ooh, 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 I like it. Mm. Okay. You're a sharp cookie. I better be. You have to be. There's a halakha found in the Talmud that wine 
wine. That is not mevushal. What does mevushal mean? It probably says in the back of the book. Not cooked, not boiled. You might not know this, but many Jewish companies boil their wine. And the reason they boil their wine is to protect it from being touched by someone who's not Jewish. What's the problem with having wine touched by someone who's not Jewish? In order to understand this halakha, you have to stop thinking about the non-Jew who is alive today. And start to think about the non-Jews that we lived with once upon a time. The non-Jews that we lived with once upon a time were not atheists. They were not apathetic to religion. They were not just uh, people who put up Christmas lights. That wasn't the style of non-Jews we lived with. We lived with very, very, very religious, very devout non-Jews. They were Catholics. They were Muslims. They were whatever they were. They were very, very devout. And just like a Jew who's very devout, a non-Jew who's very devout rarely does things that are not religious. A Christian who's truly a Christian will always be doing things for the sake of Christianity. Just like a Jew who's truly religious, the food he buys in the grocery store is going to reflect his personal devotion to the laws of Kashrut. If there's a bottle of wine sitting out, or let's say, I'm walking in the forest with my wife, uh, some nice uh, forest in Canada, New York, uh, Israel, wherever I am, and I see these beautiful trees, what's probably the first thing I'm going to say? You know? Beautiful trees, beautiful flowers. There's a blessing. Right, so I, I, very good. There's a blessing. I won't actually say the blessing because they'll say they're not that beautiful. No. But I'm inspired. I am in Niagara Falls. What would I say? Very good. I would say, Hashem, how incredible are your creations? Everything with wisdom. Your world is filled with things that you created. I would say something to that effect. And I actually remember as a kid when I would hike up the trails in Canada with my parents, we would find these little statues, rocks piled on top of each other, that I believe it's a Hindu tradition, that they actually stack up rocks on top of each other and pray to them. You know, you didn't pray mincha on the side of the street, so what do you have? You build your idol for your mincha prayer, and you, and you pray to the idol. It's also a Christian thing. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. So, great. Um, someone who's truly religious, everything they touch, everything they come in contact with will be, <coughs> how can I find God inside of it? How will I use it for a godly practice? The problem is, when the non-Jews who are around you are idol worshippers of their nature. They don't believe in the same God you believe in. They believe in something that you're not allowed to believe in. And that thing that they just built for the sake of God goes from being something beautiful to being something destructive to the unity of Hashem in this world. And therefore you're not allowed to enjoy it anymore. You can't have benefit from something that was put into this world that angers Hashem, that gets rid of Hashem's unity in the world. We are, one thing you can say about Jews, we believe in one God. Even those Jews who don't believe in God, they don't believe in one God. You understand? Like if a, a Jew doesn't believe in God and he sends his kid to Catholic school, he'll tell his kid, listen, what they're telling you is a lie. The God that we don't believe in is only one. And that's, that's how much we only believe in one God. And so at our essence, anything that is connected to God, to idol worship, we don't touch. If you would have a beautiful synagogue, don't tell me what your synagogue does. Shulchan Aruch says, you are not allowed to plant a tree in your synagogue or around your synagogue, or in the garden of your synagogue, or even close to your synagogue. Shulchan says, because that's the way non-Jews who believed in trees, that's what they would do. They'd plant these beautiful gardens and go worship the trees in the garden. And so Jews, we have a law that when you build uh, synagogues, you cannot plant trees around your synagogue. That's how far we stay away from anything that even smells like an idolatrous custom. So along comes my non-Jew. Let's give him a name. A good name. John? Come on. I'm John. Yeah. John, okay, John. Yeah. 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 Bill. Bill. John, John. So John, John comes along, and he's a Catholic priest. And he sees a beautiful bottle of wine sitting on the table. He says, hey, I want to dedicate this wine to my Lord and Savior. And now he hands me the bottle of wine. Because he's making L'chaim, the name of his Lord and Savior. Yeah, but you I am. Say Lord and I, well, it's his Lord and Savior. For me, he's my uh, illegitimate brother. So, <laughs> so the Lord and Savior 
I'm not allowed to drink from the wine. The wine has now become what's called Yain Nesif. It was wine that was dedicated for the worship of an idol. Now what if you didn't say anything? You didn't hear, you didn't say, for the sake of my Lord and Savior. The Talmud says, you don't understand. Non-Jews are very devout people. They're very committed to their religions. They wear crosses, they have crosses on their bumper stickers. They, you ever seen Jews, like, when's the last time you saw a Jew decorate the outside of his house for Hanukkah? Never. We're not as devout as they are. It's a fact of the world. When's the last time a Jew said, ah, oh, I'm going to go to war for the sake of my religion? Come on. We'll lobby Congress, we'll put together a few uh, uh, gala dinners, but we'll never go to war. War is for, we don't do that kind of thing. We are not as devout, in a good way perhaps, but not as devout as the people around us. And therefore we say that the, the assumption is that if a non-Jew touches an open bottle of wine, or wine in a glass, or wine once it's come out of a barrel, or has moved wine in any significant way, they had in mind that they were doing it for their God. And therefore, a Jew was never allowed to drink wine that was touched by a non-Jew. When it's open. When it's open. Well, when it's closed, you can't actually dedicate it. This is a, it's a good point. If a wine is sealed in something, like in a bottle, it can't be dedicated to anybody because you have no way to use it until you open the bottle. Once it's open and once it comes out of a barrel, that's the only time it could become Yain Nesif. Let's take it a step further. How can I protect my wine from ever becoming Yain Nesif? We make it go through a process called Bishu, cooking wine. Tell me why. Because then it's already cooked, so, they can, so it's already dedicated to Hashem, and then if it's open... Mm, then no, tell me about cooked wine. Very good. Someone who's a wine connoisseur will never drink wine that has been boiled. No. It's like the worst thing you can do to wine is boil it. You boil the wine, it becomes Manashevitz. You ever taste of Manashevitz? <laughs> you think the local wine and cheese magazine is going to do a, a, a review on Manashevitz? <laughs> no, but they will do it on Boston Newton. Maybe. Maybe, but Bartonura is not a high-class wine. Bartonura is a sweet wine. <coughs> As someone who really knows their wines will yeah, know... people that know their wine, they but, but not drink They're in Hutchinson, but some very good wine. Very good. Oh. That are not, that are not oh. Mevushal. That's right. Very good. Thank you. Very good. And I so, here, here steps in the story. If you invalidate the wine from being a good wine, no non-Jew will have the audacity to offer that wine to their God. And the assumption is that if we boil the wine, a non-Jew will never have the chutzpah to bring this wine to their gut. So tell me a story. Why are we willing to use boiled wine for our gut when we know that they won't use boiled wine for their gut? But if I'm supposed to be offering the best wine that I have to my gut, why am I always using the one that even a non-Jew wouldn't use? for their Lord and Savior. Well, maybe the answer is we shouldn't. The answer is that we shouldn't. The truth is we shouldn't. We shouldn't. But okay. You would use such a wine when you know that you have non-Jews sitting at your table. And you want to make sure that everyone can feel part of the meal and they want to pass around the Kiddush cup and you want to make sure that it's okay. Now some Sephardic rabbis say that the wine has to be boiled to the point where it actually tastes spoiled. And that if it doesn't taste spoiled, the wine still can't be touched by a non-Jew. Okay, so how do we get from here to the wedding? Yeah. If we believe in one God, why does it matter if a non-Jew dedicated to his God? I mean, there is no other God, so we can dedicate to whatever. To whoever you want. Yeah, because we believe in one God, so it's okay, it's the same God. The Torah tells us, though, that anything that was dedicated to another God has to be destroyed. It's, it's in the Torah. HaKadosh Baruch told us that I cannot allow for anything, because for me, yeah, you're right, I don't care. I, don't, I believe in one God. But the fact that this person allows in the world that there could be a belief in another God is a problem. He also believes in one God. He doesn't believe in one God. No. 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 Okay, if he believes in one God, she's right. The class right. What about, what about a Muslim? A mu- believe it or not, believe it or not, they might have a crazy religion, but when it comes to God, Muslims believe in one God. Yeah, but they also don't drink alcohol, so you would assume, <laughs> fairly, assume, fairly assume that they're not going to... Uh, oh, oh, Rachel has to say, they don't drink alcohol. Now, I, I had a friend who in Iran, his, his father used to have a wine, a illegal wine business. He provided all the Jews in the neighborhood with wine for Kiddush. 
So uh, his biggest class, and how did he save himself from the Iranian religious police that were going around? It's what he made. They were his biggest customers. <laughs> the religious police that were supposed to be out there catching the people who drank alcohol, they were buying the wine from, so that he was under their protection. But the Benish Chai actually does say that in a, in a Muslim country, for example, or perhaps in an atheist country, the laws will be slightly different. Slightly different the details of which we don't have to go on right now. But it would be different if he did believe in one God. Here you're talking about something who doesn't believe in one God, namely Christians. And Christians do use wine in their church services. Yes, they do. They do. So this is not a far-fetched idea. Well, they consider it a lot, though. Right. Wine away first. Yeah, consider many things. Yeah. So, so let's read to you from Shukhanu. How do we get from here to the wedding ceremony? When's the last time a rabbi... When's the last time a rabbi did a wedding ceremony for non-Jews? Uh, don't tell me that you know a rabbi who does wedding ceremonies for non-Jews. A real rabbi. They don't do it. So why are we talking about two cups of wine? The wine was being touched by somebody. Let me read you a halakha from the Code of Jewish Law. It's in Yoreda. Maran says, Mumal. What is a Mumal? A Mumal is a is Jewish who violates his Judaism. Lehachis. Afinu ledavar khan. A Jew who, in order to spite the Jewish community, violates one law. He says, yeah, I'm going to do everything. He said, I'm not going to wear... Titi. Why? Just to spite you. Just to spite the community. Lahachis. Not that he doesn't wear titi, but it's lahachis. It's to anger people. Oshu mumal lavodat kochavim. Or he's a Jew that has become an, a believer in idol worship. For example, he converts to a different faith. Now, he can actually become part of a different faith, but he can join this category of people. It's a good group. O lechalel Shabbat befahesia. Or one who would desecrate Shabbat in front of ten people. Or one who violates the whole Torah, except for Shabbat and idol worship. Keep Shabbat, believes in one God, doesn't do anything else. Dino says the Shulchan Aruch, Ke'oved Kochavim. His status is a status of a non-Jew. If none of you fell out of your chair, that means you didn't hear what I just said. Yes, I did. The status is the status of a non-Jew. I heard every word. Thank you, Steph. The one who violates one mitzvah to make people angry, the one who violates Shabbat publicly, the one who's converted to a different religion, or the one who violates all the mitzvah until Allah except for one. And if, if someone is to walk out, this is not the right time to walk out. Hey. Like a little redneck. Over there. So, the halakha that was going around the Jewish community was that a Jew who doesn't keep Shabbat, when he comes to my Shabbat table, when he touches my Kiddush cup, makes my wine idol worship wine. And this is the attitude that is still reflected in many Jewish communities today. And this is where Rabbi Levi says that's the custom that started in Europe of having two different glasses of wine. So, let me give you an example. Let's say I just made the burpee gift in here, in this cup, and I hand it over to my wife and to her friend, who are now getting married and have, obviously my wife's not getting married, so somebody else, and they don't keep Shabbat. So the rabbis in Ashkenaz said, hey, they can drink from the cup, but it can't be passed back to the rabbi, because the rabbi can't drink from this cup anymore, because the wine inside is not kosher, like if it was touched by an idol worshiper. And so the rabbi always had two cups. So he would have a second cup to do the next part of the wedding ceremony on. Oh, so then, you think in Sephardic countries they had, they didn't have people who drink Shabbat? Yeah. yeah. Of course they had. Of course they had. So why did they use one cup? Abba. You know one thing for me, that you've always heard from me. When it comes to the Jewish law, who does Sephardim always follow? The Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan Aruch. Rabbi Yosef Cairo, who just said this halakha, the one who desecrates Shabbat is considered a non-Jew. Mm -hmm. So how, in a Sephardic country, how do they, even if there was a different opinion other than this, how do they have the right to follow it? If Rabbi Yosef Cairo says someone who doesn't observe Shabbat is considered a non-Jew, how many people find that highly offensive, that someone who doesn't keep Shabbat is considered like a non-Jew? Yeah. 
I find it highly offensive. I have to tell you. I, I, I'm not judging right or wrong, just highly offensive. I definitely put it into that category. But perhaps you have to understand the idea behind the halakha to know why it is that Sephardim and Ashkenazim view this halakha different. When you lived all together as a Jewish community in Babel, in Babylon, or in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, and one Jew got up and said, I, everyone is keeping Shabbat. There's, you can't open up your store on Shabbat because nobody's going to buy from you. Everybody kept Shabbat. And you say, I am not going to keep Shabbat. What were you in essence saying? I don't want to be a part of you. Now, he says someone who violates Shabbat publicly, not privately, what you do in your home, I don't, I don't know about. Someone who publicly makes it a, a statement, I'm going to blare my music out of my apartment on Shabbat morning. That person essentially is saying, I don't want to be a part of your community. To which our rabbi said, that's great. You have the choice. You can choose not to be part of our community. Go. If you come to one of our ceremonies and drink our wine, we won't touch it, just like we wouldn't touch it from an idol worshiper. If you come to synagogue, we're not going to count you as the tenth person for a minyan, because you said you don't want to be part of the community. So how can I count you as part of the community if you don't want to be part of it? What was the logic behind putting together such a room? I mean, why, just ignore the guy. Why, why react to him? If all of your friends said, hey, we always go for coffee on Wednesday morning. You said you, you hate us, you never want to know us. And we stop inviting you for coffee on Wednesday morning. What are you going to feel like? Bad. Bad. Yeah, but you said that you don't want to come anymore. But still you're going to feel bad. And what might be the next conclu- step that you'll take? I mean, it, it puts pressure on not doing that. Very good. You might try to do anything in the world to find favor in those people, so they take you back to the coffee group on Wednesday mornings. And the idea was, you can step out, you can make that choice, but it's going to be so socially difficult for you, that we hope you're going to make the right decision and come back. It was in order to keep people in the fold. It was a Jewish mm-hmm. pressure thing. Now translate this into the year 2015, where we don't have such tight-knit communities. As someone comes to the synagogue and he says, Hey, get out, you don't keep Shabbat. What are they going to do? They're going to try very hard to come back? No. no. They're going to get out and not come back. And then what just happened? We lost a person. We lost a person. Now, to back this up, Rabbi Yosef Cairo says they're like a non-Jew. So once they become to the status of a non-Jew, does that mean they can stop keeping kosher too? No. Why? But a non-Jew doesn't have to keep kosher. Because a Jew can never be a non-Jew. But he just said he's like a non-Jew. He's like. He's like. 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 not a So tell me like how. Like how. The way you treat him, not the, the, way, the way he behaves. Like, meaning he's not actually non-Jew. He has to keep Torah mitzvot. He can come back. But we, for the moment that he wants to be treated that way, we'll treat him that way. Very good. You picked up on a good point. And so, the Ashkenazi rabbis, and it could be that they lived in communities where this was enforceable. I don't know. They felt, listen, we are going to treat Jews who don't keep Shabbat like non-Jews. They'll come to our house. They'll touch our wine. That wine we won't drink anymore. In Sephardic the culture was very different. The attitude towards one who didn't keep Shabbat was very different. And it could be because, whereas in Europe, those who stopped keeping Shabbat did so out of ideological reasons and out of starting a reform movement and out of fighting the mainstream rabbinate, it could be that there was really a war going on between those who didn't keep Shabbat and those who did keep Shabbat. In the Sephardic communities, and you might even be familiar with this yourself, the Sephardic guy who doesn't keep Shabbat, it's not an issue with God. He doesn't hate Hashem. He doesn't hate the rabbis. He doesn't hate his community. He just... He wants to watch soccer games. It's almost like he, he would keep Shabbat if it was convenient for him. Are you familiar with this attitude? That's probably the attitude, by the way, of most people who don't keep Shabbat and are sitting at your Shabbat table. You have to imagine, it's not the guy who doesn't keep Shabbat and he's going to church every Sunday. This guy doesn't keep Shabbat and he's driving to synagogue. He doesn't keep Shabbat, but he's doing Kiddush at your Shabbat table. And so the Sephardic rabbis felt very, very upset by the fact that you would consider such a person non-Jewish. He doesn't want to separate himself from the Jewish people. If he did want to separate himself from the Jewish people, would he be at your Shabbat table? No. Would he be at Shul? No. So why are you treating him like a non-Jew? Divorce him. But it doesn't work. All you're going to do is scare him away. And so the Sephardim say, we're not saying that the law has changed. Just this law doesn't apply to the person who doesn't keep Shabbat today. Because your average Jew who doesn't keep Shabbat, Shabbat is not a signifier anymore of who really cares about being Jewish or being part of the community or believing in God. It used to. But not anymore. 
And if you're not with it and you don't pick up on that, you are out of touch with the Judaism that is alive today. And I want to read to you this from the writing of Rabbi Vadi Yosef, who dealt with this issue. Rabbi Vadi Yosef became a Sephardic chief rabbi in a very weird generation. It was the first generation of... Oh, it's mine. It's true. <laughs> so, Rav Vali Yosef lived in the generation, he became a Sephardic chief rabbi in a generation where Sephardim used to be devoutly religious, and whereas in Europe, everyone was devoutly religious until the 1700s about, where, where movements started taking them away from their observance. In the Sephardic countries, when Jews started leaving Judaism was 1948, that was essentially the first year where Sephardic Jews stopped being observant. Those were the years that Rabbi Yavadi Yosef was becoming a rabbi. And he came in contact for the first time with Sephardic Jews who loved God, who came to synagogue on Friday night, who went home and did Kiddush, and then watched the TV at their house, and then drove to the beach on Shabbat morning, and then had Shabbat lunch again, and then did Havdalah, and kept kosher. It, it was a crazy world. Sephardim had never been in this situation. European Jews were already used to this. Sephardic Jews had never heard of it before. And the question was, how do we treat these people? You might have heard stories that in European families they would sit shiva on people and they, would, they, would, they were no longer part of the family. In Sephardic circles, on a social level, forget on a halachic level, this is a normal thing. It's a no- I have an aunt. She doesn't keep Shabbat. Not at all. I mean, not at all. She watches TV and she turns on and off lights. She will never cook on Shabbat. Never. In the life of her. She keeps kosher, not just kosher, she only buys chalak bet Yosef meat. It's like a, the highest Sephardic hechsher in Israel. So she doesn't even eat the kosher symbols that I would eat. But she doesn't keep Shabbat. And so, when, for example, when we got married, I can sure. My wife said, how do you know she keeps kosher? She doesn't keep Shabbat. I said, what does keeping Shabbat have to do with keeping kosher? So what do you mean? If she doesn't keep Shabbat, she probably doesn't keep kosher. I said, maybe where you come from. But not where I come from. I would, my aunt doesn't let me into her kitchen. Like my grandmother. Like my mother. Never let me into the kitchen. My grandma would say, this is meat, this is milk, stop confusing my dishes. That's what she would tell me. But they were very, now my grandma Bukh Hashem kept Shabbat and kosher and all the halakhot. But they were raised in a home where it's not an all or nothing package. And if I'm struggling with something, it doesn't make me removed from my community. And so Rabbi Vadi Yosef actually was the first rabbi in Israel to deal with this question. In Europe, you had two opinions. You had those rabbis who were okay, in Germany mostly. The rabbis were saying, listen, you have to take people at face value. They are what they are. They're presenting themselves in the synagogue. Accept them when they come. And you had the Ashkenazi rabbis of Eastern Europe who were very rigid about this. If you don't keep Shabbat, that's great. Move to Germany. Move to America. Don't come to my community. In Sephardic countries, we didn't have the struggle till Israel. And listen what Rav Vadi Yosef says. Ravadia writes, Vani Tama, and I'm, I'm very bewildered at Ashkenazi rabbis who consider these Jews non Jewish. Shalaf Hamumar Lechalel Shabbat, even the one who really violates Shabbat to make everyone upset, Dino Kisrael Lechol Davar, he's considered Jewish in every aspect. He's obligated all the mitzvot, and any mitzvah that he violates, he's responsible for. He'll be punished even for the smallest avera. And if I agree to consider this Jew non-Jewish, if I'm willing to allow you to embarrass such people, and to embarrass them in public, the Shabbat table, to, to make the wine not kosher because they touched it, it's like I might as well just murder them. He said, it's like spilling their blood, he said. They're going to run away also from Shabbat and also from Kiddush and also from a synagogue. And instead of just not keeping Shabbat, they will violate every mitzvah in the Torah. And our hands will be the hands that spilled this blood. Nobody else. And Chamavadi went out on a limb. And he said, this guy that comes to the Knesset and he goes home and does Kiddush and he watches his TV and he drives somewhere to the beach on Shabbat morning, he's considered a Jew like any other Jew in the world. And you being strict and not wanting to drink his wine because maybe there's an opinion that Shulchan Aruch says, he says, you will be responsible for the murder of the Jew. 
because if he didn't do just Shabbat until now, because of you, he'll be disconnected from his Judaism entirely. And when I look at this wedding ceremony, and I say, you're going to use two cups at a person's wedding ceremony. They brought you to be the rabbi. You have the right to say, I won't marry you. But to come to someone's wedding, and to say, you're Jewish enough for me to take money under the table for doing your wedding. But you're not Jewish enough for me to drink from the same cup that you drink from. For me, there's no greater desecration of Hashem's name than that. And where's... Very good. Now, whereas, like I told you, these are not halachot. I am not the big enough person to tell all the Ashkenazi rabbis who are of that opinion that they're wrong. I can't tell them that. I, bigger than me. That's part of being small. But I can tell you that on a halachic, moral, ethical, spiritual level, it is incorrect. Not just incorrect, but it's being out of touch with the reality of Jews who are alive today. If this Jew is sitting at your Shabbat table, it happened to me in my community. Somebody from my community yeah. has a son who doesn't keep Shabbat. He doesn't miss a Shabbat prayer, but he doesn't keep Shabbat. So what does it mean he doesn't keep Shabbat? I don't know what it means he doesn't keep Shabbat. He doesn't keep Shabbat. And he went to somebody's house. None of my community. And he came to their Shabbat table and he touched a bottle of wine. He brought it to the man to the Kiddush on. And this man said, Oh no! We can't use his wine! And he took it to the kitchen and poured the whole bottle down the sink. He, he took it to the kitchen and what? Poured, poured the whole bottle of wine down the sink. Wine oh. poured down the drain. Because he told me he can't use it because he touched it. And I, and I said, forget, imagine, imagine for a moment. Let's say he wants to really be strict and not use that wine. He thinks that it's a halakha. He can put it aside. You can quietly give it to your wife to take it away to the other room. Why go to the kitchen and... Oh, come. Why make a whole scene out of it and... But that person, I'll tell you, this boy has never been back to those people's house. And the only Shabbat houses he wanted to go to are very few people. And that's, but it's not a Shanda. Because I'll tell you the truth. Then in 98% of Orthodox synagogues... No, you don't know what a Shanda means. It's an embarrassment. <laughs> I know what a Shanda is. Oh, okay. I know what a Shanda is. <laughs> it's a Shanda. It's a Shanda. In 98% of Orthodox synagogues, this is the attitude. <laughs> And you might not know it, because most of the wine that's being around has been boiled, so they'll let you touch it. But I'm demanding from the Jewish... There's also something called being a man. I don't know, that's absolutely, this everyone has to know. This everyone has to know, which is right. Tamar's saying, even if they want to hold on to your tradition, there's a way to do it. There's a way not to embarrass the person sitting at your table. But that's yeah. what Hakam uh, Yosef says. It's like no, 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 no. Uh, yeah, but what Rabbi Yosef says to the contrary, he said you cannot treat that person like a non-Jew. That's what I'm saying. He's and saying you're not just being a man. It's like he's built his bread. So I went, I once went to have of parents, and I asked him, Rabbi, so what's your opinion? Where do you sit on this fence? And our parents said, let me tell you. There are some people who don't keep Shabbat, that I will make kiddush on a glass of wine that they poured me. Because they really believe in Hashem. So there are some people who keep Shabbat, that if they would pour me a glass of wine, I would pour it down the drain. And I wouldn't make kiddush on it. And someone laughed. They said, don't laugh, I'm being very serious with you. He said, it's enough, enough, to start defining people by certain actions, and start looking at people as to what do they truly represent. Who are they really? And so when I shared this with the class, uh, a group of young rabbis, one guy stood up, was very angry at me. He said, so what? So he's your rabbi. So your rabbi is so lenient about, about this halakha of wine touch my non-Jews. So we don't have to be lenient like him. I, I was like a little put off. I didn't know what to say. So I was sitting in the same room with one of my friends and my colleagues, Rabbi Sam Shore. And Rabbi Sam, he was not a student of repairs. Don't worry about repairs. Many years older than us. And Rav Sam said, no, Rabbi Peretz is not lenient on Yai Nesach, on wine touch by non-Jews. He's just very, very strict on Havat Sayyid, on loving other Jews. He said, get your priorities in order. He said, what's more important to you, the wine that you're making Kiddushan, or another Jew who's sitting at your Shabbat table? And is it fair to say that? It's absolutely fair to say that. And it's time for us, and I'm asking you again, here, you see this in the wedding ceremony. It's time for you to demand the leadership of the Jewish people reflect what is going on in the Jewish community. You cannot. You cannot be the rabbi of a community and treat the people who are sitting in their community as if they're not Jews, unless they change. You can't. I mean, you can. You're a morally corrupt person. You cannot take someone's money. You cannot officiate at somebody's wedding if you believe that they are just as bad as a Catholic priest who believes in an idol. You can't. 
And if you do, there's something so morally defunct with your attitude and your religion that I don't want to be a part of it. Please don't label me as an Orthodox Jew. And it's time you, people who are learning Torah, start to see two sides of this equation. And there are many Ashkenazi rabbis. Many. I have a whole, I'm writing a book on it right now, actually, as we speak, on this topic of wine. I'm going to bring you four, five, six Ashkenazi rabbis who led the generation. That's not like a, some guy I pulled out of an a Orthodox synagogue in Nashville, Tennessee. Big Ashkenazi rabbis who agreed with Rabbi Vadi Yosef and said it even a hundred years before he said it. They said it about Berkat Kuanim. They said it about counting Jews to an aliyah, to give them a, a minya, all kinds of things. They already said it. It's not an Ashkenazi Sephardic divide. It's a, do you believe in people? Do you believe in humanity? Do you believe in the Jewish people who come to your community? Or do you not? And it's a choice you have to make. And it's a choice that is the community. Both those of us who would consider ourselves Shabbat observers, and both those of us who consider ourselves not yet Shabbat observers, we have to make this divide also. And say, either we're part of the same family, that we're part of the same religion, and we do Kiddush together, or we're not, but start acting like it. Then be honest with us about it. And tell us how you really feel. And B'zalat Hashem, I hope that most of us will choose the proper side of this equation and to realize that we have so much, so much good inside of us and so much power inside of us to change this world and to change this ideology. So B'zalat Hashem, at the next wedding you go to, you'll see that they only use one cup. Try the <laughs>